We'll turn this on again. Good to go. Yep, I got to just turn it back on. Okay, everyone. Well, I hope everybody had a uh, good lunch. I hope you got to take a, a look at the little bit of the museum, especially that great view from the terrace of uh, Blue Mountain. And so hopefully that'll get you in the frame of mind as now we go from the terrestrial to the aquatic side of this. And, you know, really looking at some of these incredible lakes that we have right here is, is definitely one of the reasons why we want to talk about um, an invasive species that we're really concerned about. And we really wanted to use this pairing of hemlock woolly adelgid and hydrilla because they have a very similar um, type of maybe landscape level impact, but it's a similar type of story of, okay, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid came in here, we're, we're responding to it, we're trying to, you know, manage with it, what's now going to be a part of our landscape. Well, with hydrilla, we're a little bit lucky. We, for the past, um, almost for 10 years now, we've been talking about this species that is in our region and keeps getting a little bit closer, but it's not yet here in the Adirondacks. And so that really gives us the opportunity to learn about it, think about what the impacts could be, and think about what we could do um, to help management. So. Um, after having such a great uh, morning speakers, we set a very high bar, um, but I'm really thrilled that we have some awesome, incredible speakers here. So thanks for sticking around and talking about um, Hydrilla. Our first speaker is going to be Meg Modley. She is the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager for the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Uh, for the portion of the Adirondacks that is in the Lake Champlain Basin, uh, we're super fortunate. They do so much and bring so many resources, and they coordinate across uh, New York, Vermont, and into Quebec for the, the watershed of the Lake Champlain Basin. Now, one of the things that, unfortunately, is um, the downside of it is Lake Champlain is our most invaded uh, water body that we have in the Adirondacks. And so it is a place of concern, but Meg has been a great leader with doing things on rapid response, um, she's leading up a lot of our great work on the Round Gobi, and uh, she is just an awesome person and a mom of, of two young kids like me, so I appreciate her taking the time to come all the way across the lake to, uh, to New York here, and she's going to lead us off first talking about uh, giving an introduction to Hydrilla. So we'll have Meg, give me a round of applause for Meg to come on up. Thank you, Brian. You can hear a little bit of the residual cold that my son left me from last week. So um, <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. And for all parents in the room, hats off. It's been a doozy. Um, but thank you for also reminding me of why Lake Champlain is such an important um, component of what's happening in the Adirondacks relating to aquatic invasive species. We are home to 51 known non-native and invasive species. and just to clarify, those non-native species, there are quite a number of them are on the fence. Uh, we haven't been able to measure that they're causing economic or environmental or human health harm yet, but um, there are quite a few on that fence. And I think out of our 51, there's general consensus that about a dozen of them are invasive themselves. And so we're a source lake then for those Adirondack lakes and those inland water bodies in the state of Vermont. Um, so we are really up on our on our toes looking out for hydrilla. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit more of a regional picture here and some background on hydrilla and then we brought in some of the scary talks to get your attention and then hopefully we'll talk um, at the end about all the good things that we can do uh, to help prevent it from getting into our waters. So introduction to hydrilla, um, which we affectionately call the hydrilla killa um, in the aquatics world. Um, this is a slide of the unfortunately past Dr. Mike Netherland from the University, uh, excuse me, from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, you should know, is the only federal agency out there who is tasked with studying and researching aquatic plant management and control. Okay, so they're the ones who have huge greenhouses doing lots of research in addition to all of our excellent academic institutions and other groups out there that are focused, and they are, they are really looking at hydrilla very seriously. But they call it the almost perfect weed. And I think, you know, if we were to say what's the number one invasive that's, aquatic invasive that's impact the Adirondack waters and across sort of the northeast region, we typically look to the milfoils. We typically look to Eurasian uh, variable leaf milfoil and say, you know, that one's had some pretty widespread impacts. We have data that show that they've been decreased in shorefront property. Um, 
uh, prices, et cetera. But this weed, this aquatic invasive plant, um, has the ability to cover literally thousands and thousands of contiguous acres. And we see that in the southeast, not so much in the northeast yet. Um, it has a number of different ways by which it reproduces. And the biggest one that we're, we have learned to be concerned about are the tubers which is a little, uh, it looks like a root, like a fleshy bulb at the bottom of the plant that can overwinter and be viable for a number of years. But it also spreads by turians and crowns. Um, it has extremely rapid growth weights, rates, and it is a plant that has these compensatory modes so that it's able, when stressed in one area, can use other parts of its energy to grow other parts of the plant. Um, and what we've also learned is that genetics are really important here. So. Let's give you the background on it. This is called Hydrilla verticillata. Um, it is um, an aquatic submerged plant. So it roots in the sediments. It grows up to the surface of the water up to about you know, nine meters depth. Um, and once it gets to the surface, it just starts branching off. And it looks like curly hair you know, lasagna soup, basically, at the water surface. Um, the leaves around the stem are whorled, and it looks very much like our native Elodea. Um, so the, the, this is a picture here of those tubers. Let me get the right button, I hope. Yes. So this tuber growth is under the sediment. This is a turian growing off of the stem of the plant. And these are the whorls around the stem. And what's important here is if you have more than three, typically four, five, or six around the whorl, start paying attention. The second thing is you're looking, you can just barely see there's a jagged or toothed edge along the edge of the leaflet. So if you see something, you should be seeing Elodea out there all the time. Um, take a closer look. And if you think something's suspect, please collect it and report it. Um, why this is so challenging is it does have a lot of native lookalikes. Um, it's similar to an invasive Brazilian Elodea, Egeria densa. Um, but it also looks a lot like our native Elodea canadensis and western water, mil water weed, which is called Elodea nutali. We have intercepted and found Elodea nutali on watercraft coming in and out of Lake Champlain and had to do genetics because we couldn't tell the difference between Elodea nutali and um, Hydrilla verticillata. But luckily, it wasn't Hydrilla. <laughs> Um, so economic and ecological impacts. So mostly in the south where we have abundant growth of this plant, it shades out the natives. Um, it's going to slow water flow. And in the south, that's a big deal with irrigation, canals, um, aqueducts, all these different major infrastructure projects that can be flooded or um, damaged by hydrilla um, causing flooding. It impedes swimming, boating, and fishing. So obviously, if you're trying to recreate in that, it's not going to happen. Um, there is some research that shows where it grows in dense beds. It pushes out fish spawning habitat, um, and it can alter some water chemistry, lower oxygen levels in very um, dense areas where it grows. So there are two different known biotypes of hydrilla, um, generally, we thought, uh, monoecious and dioecious. And so why I'm bothering to tell you this is geographically in our country, most of the Monetius hydrilla does well in the northern, sort of mid-Atlantic and north region, and the dioecious does better in the southeast. So hydrilla found in the southern U.S. has, both, has female flowers only. Monetius, sort of in the northeast, has male and female parts on the same plant. They're from different places on the planet, right? Dioecious is from India and the monoecious is from Korea. So each biotype behaves differently. It has a different um, phenology, which means that you really need to understand when the plant's going to grow, bud, grow turions, grow tubers, so that you know the appropriate points of time in which to control the plant. So that's why genetics are so important. And here's a map of the United States. <coughs> so. In the 1950s, there was an aquarium release that we were aware of down in Florida. This was the dioecious form of hydrilla. And it got out, and it got into canals, and then it spread quite extensively. And then around 1985, um, we think there was a separate introduction on the Potomac River. Um, that was the monoecious biotype. And that, as you can see, the green on the map is the monoecious. So 
The Monetius really is doing quite well in the mid-Atlantic and creeping into the northeast. We have some overlap region, which Dr. Susan Wilde will talk to us about. Um, and then uh, really predominantly dioecious in the southeast and a little bit out west. So I'm going to take you to Connecticut River because this is significant for our northeast region and I think it's relative to the Adirondacks. We have not had huge infestations of hydrilla in our region until the last few years. So when, when, when hydrilla was found in the Connecticut River, which touches Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and goes up into Canada, it's a very large watershed. It was found in the southern end of the Connecticut River, and there's a group called the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel, which Brian sits on and I sit on, and New York State is a member of three different regional panels in the United States, the Great Lakes, the Northeast, and the Mid-Atlantic. Lucky New York, you touch all of those regions. Um, but our Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel became quite alarmed because we haven't dealt with a lot of hydrilla yet. So we got together, we invited the Army Corps in. Um, we started look at working with the Army Corps on how we would effectively survey for hydrilla throughout the Connecticut River knowing that if the Connecticut River population succeeds, which it's doing, it is going to be a huge threat to the rest of the Northeast, including the Adirondacks, and hopefully not get into Lake Champlain. Um, so we wanted to figure out what kind of genetic species was in the Connecticut River, work on education and outreach materials, um, and better define the existing population and develop a management plan. So we met with the Army Corps of Engineers. They came in. Um, they showed us how to collect tubers and do coring and try and study how long this population had been in the Connecticut River. Um, we had agreement from Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont to go out and survey in this 50 meter grid overlay for presence, absence, and report it back. And then the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station took on mapping what was found, which is awesome. So here we are, multi multiple states collaborating together so we go out there and then we can't find tubers. And so we bring in experts from different organizations that manage hydrilla um, in New York and in other parts of the Northeast. Um, experts from CPRO and Solitude, from the Army Corps even, collecting gobs and gobs and gobs of hydrilla from the Connecticut River. We can't find tubers. Well, this is odd. Um, so we said, okay, we're gonna come up with funding to do the genetics analysis, it's time. Something's weird here, it looks different. Um, <clears throat> and what we found is we sent it to Dr. Nick Tippery at the University of Wisconsin, and he keyed it out, and it wasn't monoecious, and it wasn't dioecious. And we're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is not funny. Um, there's, there's no tuber. Uh, and then luckily the Army Corps said, okay, we're gonna help you out. Um, we're gonna offer to collect samples from all the known infestations across the Northeast, and multiple um, locations within the Connecticut River and, con and compare them. So they took, we put out a call, and we got all these different states, including New York, to send in samples of the genetics of the populations known in New York and across the Northeast. Come out to find Dr. Dean Williams from Texas Christian University did the analysis and he found that we have a completely different clade C of hydrilla in the Connecticut River. All the M's are monoecious. So these are all of our monoecious hydrilla populations. Clade C. Okay. So we don't know a lot about clade C. We need to know how it grows, how we can manage it. Um, this became a big challenge for us. So we said we need some consistent messaging. We developed signage and tip strips that Brian has. He can send them around to the team um, just to help folks understand what it is, how to identify it, how to report it. So we put up these signs, we've been working together, we came to agree on a five-year management plan um, for, for Hydrilla, um, which was great, and I'm just going to back up for a second to talk, to just let you know, in the state of New York, um, we have populations out in Tonawanda, you guys have probably heard of that population out in Tonawanda on the Erie Canal. Um, that's being managed aggressively by the Army Corps in the state of New York, New York DEC. The Cayuga Lake um, infestation. Um, there's a few spots on the Susquehanna. We have one in the outskirts of Bingham Binghamton. 
There's one in Creamery Pond. That was one of the early ones. Um, the New Croton River just had a celebration of no detects of hydrilla after six years of consecutive management. That's really excellent news. Um, and then there, was, there have been recent new finds in Harriman State Park uh, in the southern part of the state. But for, um, con for Connecticut, Massachusetts, not many detections in Rhode Island, mostly because I think they're not looking, um, they don't have the resources, and Maine. Most of these populations are really not too far from the coast. Not saying they came from the coast or anything. It's just that we still have a lot of protection buffering us geographically, distance-wise, from those populations. So that's good news. Um, okay, so here we are. We've got this new clade. We're developing shared signage, and we have a management plan. Um, Unfortunately, at this point, since it was found in 2016, there's over 1,000 acres that are infested in the lower Connecticut River with this new clade. Um, there's a really good video that came out. Um, maybe I can circulate it after the meeting. It's about like a 25-minute documentary from experts along the Connecticut River documenting the infestation and, and thinking about the possible impacts of this infestation on the Connecticut River. Um, it's really challenging when you're working with all these different states who can be impacted and we share one watershed. And so there's been a lot of push um, at the congressional level to try and get more money set aside, both within the Water Resources Development Act to address hydrilla in the Connecticut River and across the country. Um, but the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station has stepped up. They're getting resources to help fund additional staff that can hopefully serve to be the man in sort of the lead on the Connecticut River population. Um, other good news, Connecticut recently passed a new Connecticut voter registration fee. That funding is supposed to go back to help support aquatic invasive species management. Um, so we'll see if that money can come to fruition to help because we don't have consistent stewardship along the Connecticut River. Um, I think there's still a lot of groups that are marina owners, folks who are thinking out of sight, out of mind, who live further up the river, who don't see impacts from this population yet. Um, <coughs> so legislators are getting involved. I know that uh, Representative Blumenthal from Connecticut, as well as Senator Leahy from Vermont, got very involved in helping to push forward additional dollars through the Water Resources Development Act, understanding that this population will likely affect us where we sit today at some point. Um, and now that thousands of acres have been infested on the Connecticut River, they're really concerned about their Vallisneria populations in the southern end of the river and blueback herring spawning grounds. Um, it's really hard, unfortunately, to get the attention of folks until they really start feeling the impact. So when we're thinking about the invasion curve, we're like way on the wrong end of the invasion curve um, in the southern end of Connecticut. However, because this plant does not have tubers, because it doesn't have that ability to send out a reproductive mode into the sediment that may be viable for four years or so, and it spreads largely, we think, by turions in the Connecticut River, it may be possible that working with the Army Corps, we could have some significant impact on managing the population with a specific type of herbicide if we figure that out. So this field, this past field season, they had one trial that they tried um, and we'll, we'll hear the results of that, I'm sure, at national conferences um, shortly. I don't have the results of it now, but it is reassuring that the Army Corps is involved and engaged and has a lot of experience in managing hydrilla. Um, so just to give you from this perspective of being in the Adirondacks and part of the Lake Champlain watershed, you know, I'm working way over there in the Connecticut watershed thinking about things that are coming towards us. Um, so this is where the role of all these partners is so critical and we're in such a good place that we're connected with these regional panels, that we have great colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers, that we know experts like geneticist Dean, Dean Williams, like Dr. Susan Wild, who will speak to you next, um, that we have really phenomenal leadership within the state at New York State DEC. Kathy McGlynn has been at the lead of a lot of the hydrilla responses and all of her staff. Um, and then we have some local heroes who are popping up in the state of Connecticut. Uh, Dr. Greg Bugby, who works at the Connecticut Agricultural Research Station, and his assistant, Summer Stebbins. Um, there's been a new stakeholder group developed along the Connecticut River, organized by the Connecticut River Conservancy. 
So it takes a village. I think that the momentum is building, and I'm hoping that soon we'll see multiple millions of dollars coming into the Connecticut River watershed to help treat this population. Um, the more we know about the phenology or the life cycle of this new clade sea, the better, because we are intercepting it coming to this region, mostly overland on boats and trailers. Um, NISA is the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It happens in Washington, D.C., and there was a spotlight during that week, um, a congressional briefing on managing hydrilla and the, uh, the infestation in the Connecticut River. So the word is out. We're raising the alarm bells. Um, we need to think about how it gets moved. So primarily we think that, for example, the Croton River Reservoir in the state of New York was likely an aquarium dump. Um, hydrilla is often built, uh, sold as an aquarium plant to oxygenate your water um, and it's mislabeled or nobody has the ability to check it. Um, and what happens when all of these little pebbles, um, look at me pointing at the screen with my, <laughs> Uh, all the little pebbles on the bottom of the aquarium get dumped on the riverbank. So this is the free Nemo phenomenon that I like to refer to. You love your fish, you love your plants, you don't want to keep them anymore, you want to give them to your local water body. Um, so you go dump them. And this is what's left over, but what you don't see are those plants likely taking off in the Croton River Reservoir. Um, so aquarium dumping is a significant pathway that we need to think about. And New York is also investing a lot in the organisms and trade type of research um, in looking at uh, listing species and putting them on the prohibited list for sale and possession. Um, but then another popular way that hydrilla can move around, we are a huge attraction, right? Our tourism is our economy, um, and everybody likes to come here, and they bring their critters with them. Um, so, yes, this is egregious, but overland transport on watercraft <coughs> is popular. And we have seen watercraft coming to this region from known areas of infestation, and we have intercepted hydrilla before. So the threat is there, but we do have a response in place. We just need to be vigilant. We need to know what to look for. Another pathway that we need to consider are canal ways, right, that connect watersheds that wouldn't normally be connected. Um, we know that there's hydrilla in the Erie Canal system. It's being managed aggressively. However, hydrilla will grow, it loves canals, um, can move you know, right through, float, be entrained, whatever, into a new body of water or a new watershed. So we have to think about canals linking us together to different watersheds as well. Um, so think about the pathways of movement and think about what our responses can be. Um, I got really excited when I caught this quote coming from Connecticut, ecological crises do not recognize political boundaries. To have a politician say that is just the like, ah, moment when you're like, wow, okay, you get it, you get it. Because um, everything's political, right? Um, so this is awesome, but what I wanted to show you is a summary of data that we collected for one of our State of the Lake reports where we put all of the data together from the Adirondack Watershed Institute and the Lake Champlain Basin Program covering the Vermont, New York, and Quebec sides of Lake Champlain, we were able to figure out based on the last body of water visited that this watercraft goes to um, where we're linked to the most. So if we had to think about interrupting these pathways, we have so many people coming to Lake Champlain for bass fishing tournaments for holidays, for recreation, and for sunset cruise, for wakeboarding, all of those things. Um, but look at this connection. We have a very strong connection to the Connecticut River, as we do to other water bodies that have hydrilla in them. So um, we know that we're connected, and I think that we have created an army of stewards that are out there really doing their best to inspect and remind people to clean, drain, dry, but that is a huge one. I think an area we can invest more resources in is really talking to aquarium owners and to pet owners about releasing um, things that they have into the wild. Um, so here are our stewards being diligent, doing what they do. Here's one intercept we've had of hydrilla coming from the Connecticut River, and then I had numerous Elodio nutelli um, that we sent away for genetic testing because we could not decipher between it being a, a native or, a, or an invasive. Um, so that is just my crash course into what is hydrilla, 
where does it come from? Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is also doing a lot of biocontrol work on trying to collect agents in India, in Korea. Um, these processes typically take 10 to 20 years to find agents that are effective, that they can culture, that they can get approval from APHIS to release um, into the United States. So this is a bit of a long time coming, but I think we cannot um, underestimate the power of biocontrol. Um, it's just that I get concerned when individual lake landowners come up and say, oh, well, we should release this beetle because it worked there. And the problem is all of our lakes are different. They have a different makeup, just like our guts all have different bugs in them. And if you give them, if you put them in a lake where there's something else that they like to eat better or there's something that likes to eat them better, game over. Um, so we just need to know what we're doing. Um, but I'm really hopeful that, you know, we'll find some kind of biocontrol that is effective against Diocious or Monetious. Um, and just to heighten your interest about all of this, um, Dr. Susan Wilde can talk to you about some of the many reasons why we don't want hydrilla in our region. Um, am I way under? Uh, okay. Um, so it originally came over in Aquaria trade, so back in the 1950s. So there's a source of dioecious um, down in Florida, and then it got out and it escaped. It got in the canals. People harvest from existing populations, grow it, sell it, spread it. They may even order it now, I don't know, from India and China. But when you talk to the U.S. Border Patrol agents who are tasked with looking for these plants, they hide them. They use them as packing material. Um, there's so many holes and we just can't be everywhere all the time. And after getting some of those briefings of hearing what it's like to be a, a border agent fully donning gear and walking into a crate not knowing if like a monkey's going to attack you or there's like a poisonous frog or something in there, they find all kinds of stuff and they just ship it illeg illegally, unfortunately. The clade C, yes, yeah, so they're working on that right now. And there is um, some ideas, the challenges, um, as you heard earlier, it's not easy to work with China right now. <laughs> um, but mostly what we know about Monetius and Dioecious do stick to India and Korea. Um, but there is still some questions about exploring where we could find clade C. Um, we just have limitations with COVID and international relations right now. But that's the Army Corps really on the leading edge of that. And we could ask them. Yeah, so it doesn't key out as either. I am not a geneticist. Um, I know that, you know, in terms of its phenology, it's not putting its energy into tuber growth. So if we don't know is the answer. And it's still relatively new, having found it just in 2016. We didn't conclude and really figure out that it didn't have tubers until like 2019, 2020. Then we started running extensive genetic tests and collecting from populations all around the Connecticut River, because we're also really curious, is the Connecticut River clade C establishing and surrounding water bodies as well. We haven't seen that yet, um, but we have a lot to learn just about the growth of this clade and figuring out where its weakness points are. So. The turion, so it's a little bud or seed, where is it? find it for you. There you go. Okay, so this is like a little reproductive seed that grows off of the stem of the plant. And so in the Connecticut River, there's tons and tons of turions on the plant, and you're in a flowing system. So they're producing lots of turions. They break free, and they float downstream. 
they can reseed. Um, we don't know from clade C if a lot of waterfowl at this point are ingesting it. And again, I think this is a little bit of a lead into what Susan's going to talk about, um, a little bit about what might eat hydrilla. We'll see. Great. Well, uh, I get the privilege of getting asked to go speak to many lake associations, and I was talking with somebody inviting me from a lake association, and he said, uh, hey, I, I kind of want you to kind of scare them a little bit, you know, when you come. So, like, they get a little bit of an idea, like, why we're doing all this stuff, why we're trying to clean drain drive, why we're trying to keep things out. So, um, you know, Tamara talked about, like, some of the things today might scare you, some of the things might inspire you. This thing, you know, we're going to have um, Dr. Susan Wild come up and give a talk. And, it, you know, there is a little bit of a scare factor there, you know, which is kind of good. But the really thing that I've always been so impressed is the incredible science that is behind it. And, you know, that when we put our resources and we put things together in this 20-year investigation, you know, that, that she's been going on to have these great, um, great findings and this uh, incredible award that she's won. So um, we are super lucky to have Dr. Susan Wild. She is the Associate Professor in Aquatic Science at the University of Georgia's Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. Um, her research interests include ecological impacts of harmful algal blooms, uh, watershed development, agricultural best management practices, toxic cyanobacteria, which we'll hear about today, and invasive plants. So she came all the way up here yesterday from, um, from Georgia. We're so thrilled to have her, so please give her a warm round of applause. more of it. I have been working on this for a long time, but not by myself. Uh, this was a collaborative study with lots of other professors and folks that are in industry and federal and state government and just reservoir managers, so I don't want to take all the credit for this by far. <coughs> I'm going to give my talk today sort of like, I'm going to show you a video of what we published this last year, which will give you sort of an overview of our present state of the knowledge. But then I'll back up and, and tell you about some of the experiments that we did to get to that point. And then I'm going to talk, leave enough time to talk about what is the future, what is the next most important thing that we have questions that we want to answer. And hopefully that will be more interesting to you because I do think that you're sort of, you're trying to get ahead of this invasion and know what to do when it gets here. So I appreciate that. Hopefully this will video will work and it will tell you some things so that I don't have to. Does I think it does a good job of the overview. Triple AS Newcomb Cleveland Prize, our oldest award, recognizes an outstanding original research paper published in science each year. The winning paper is chosen based on the quality of its scholarship, innovation, presentation, <coughs> likelihood of influencing its field, and its wider interdisciplinary significance. This year, we present the prize to the paper entitled Hunting the Ego Killer, a Cyanobacterial Neurotoxin Causes Vacular Myelinopathy, first published March 26, 2021. The paper was the product of an international collaboration co-led by Susan Wild, Associate Professor of Aquatic Science at the University of Georgia, and Timo Niedermeyer, Professor of Pharmacognosy at Martin Luther University, Halle Wittenberg in Germany. At DeGray Lake, Arkansas, in fall 1994, a mass die-off of bald eagles initiated a wildlife investigation. Dozens of birds died, and many displayed odd behavior, like missing their perches and flying into rock walls. When wildlife biologists examined dead eagles, they found extensive lesions throughout their brains and spinal cords. By 1998, scientists knew that birds from at least 10 different southeastern reservoirs in five states had this new disease called vacular myelinopathy, or VM, but no one knew the cause. In addition to avian species, Susan Wild and UGA colleagues documented that VM could affect amphibians, reptiles, and fish. 
Researchers made gradual progress uncovering the cause. Wild and her colleagues in South Carolina, where many of the birds suffered from VM, found dense growth of the invasive plant Hydrilla verticillata. The plant, imported from India for use in aquariums, was overrunning man-made lakes in the southeast, readily consumed by coots, which are frequently eaten by bald eagles. Using fluorescence microscopy, Wild observed that in affected water bodies, hydrilla leaves were densely covered with cyanobacteria colonies. This novel cyanobacterium was also found in all the reservoirs where the birds had died. Wild and her colleagues speculated that the cyanobacterium produced the toxin responsible for the eagle deaths. They fed plants collected from affected water bodies to laboratory birds, confirming the plants colonized by cyanobacteria caused VM. The cyanobacterium was named Autochtonos hydrolicola, Greek for eagle killer living on hydrilla. However, no known toxin was detected in the cyanobacterium. In Germany, Niedermeyer and co-authors grew this cyanobacterium in the lab. However, lab cultured bacteria did not cause VM in test chickens. Hypothesizing that the toxin might be produced in lakes but not in the lab, they collected more hydrilla leaves from impacted lakes. Direct analysis of the cyanobacteria growing on these leaves revealed a compound not present in lab-grown autochtonos that contained five bromine atoms. The team was able to reproduce the compound in the lab when the cyanobacteria were grown in the presence of bromide. The compound was revealed to be a novel biindole alkaloid and further experiments confirmed it causes VM. The scientists called the compound a toxin, toxin that kills the eagle. Jana Marisch at the Biology Center of the Czech Academy of Sciences led the genome sequencing of Autochtonos hydrolicola, which allowed the identification of the compound's biosynthetic gene cluster. Bromide can leach from rocks, but it can also be introduced into the environment from human activities such as coal-fueled power plants or water treatment facilities. The authors recommended increasing monitoring and public awareness campaigns be implemented for hydrilla and autochtonotoxin to protect both wildlife and human health. The study brought researchers together from multiple countries and disciplines to solve a decades-old mystery and reminds us how dangerous human-induced changes to ecosystems can be. These unanticipated effects are only likely to increase as we continue to alter the world around us. Hunting the Eagle Killer, a cyanobacterial neurotoxin causes vacular myelinopathy, recipient of this year's AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize. The AAAS Newcomb Cleveland <laughs> Prize, our oldest award, recognizes an outstanding original okay, research paper really published in science you know. each year. Can I stop that? The winning paper is chosen based on the the AAAS new again. Okay. So um, when this disease was first discovered in Arkansas, it was because there was such a large bald eagle mortality over that fall and winter in 1994. And so they amassed a lot of researchers to go out and study it and did a lot of tagging. But then 95, really nothing happened that winter, and so they kind of disbanded the group, and 96, more eagles died. So it, it was something that was sort of elusive, and they thought maybe it was going to just be a one-off, but we realized pretty early on that it was occurring in lakes throughout the southeast, because when the eagle biologists traveled out to Arkansas to see how the coots were behaving in those lakes, they realized they were involved too. So when you start to look at this food chain effect, they realize it, it could be more extensive and, and we have found that. We have birds now, that's an immature bald eagle, we've had plenty of them die from this, and great horned owls, their territories are also tied to these reservoirs, so they're trying to re you know, reproduce on the same lake, and their nests were failing and we're finding them dead. The coots migrate down in the fall by the thousands and they love our hydrilla lakes because they're full of plants. So they will stop over preferentially in lakes that have all of this submerged aquatic vegetation because we don't have a lot of aquatic vegetation in our southeastern lakes because they're not lakes, <laughs> they're reservoirs, they're man-made impoundments. So you're flooding a, s a river, right? And so there's not really any native aquatic plants established. So it was kind of an open niche. I think I talked about things that didn't have anything on that slide, but I'll move on. I, um, 
I got this picture of the hunter from uh, a lake in South Carolina, and he was um, hunting there. I saw him come to the dock at the same time we're collecting samples. I asked if I could have the bird's brains, and he said, okay, but take a picture first. Now, and this uh, bird's, they did have uh, extensive lesions in the brains, but it's taken us a long time to get to the point where I think we do have a human health concern. And th this was a little bit of an outlier to begin with because it was mostly herbivorous waterfowl and then their predators, but you know, this little guy eats insects. All right, I don't know if you can see that very well, but uh, it's Atoxenos hydrilocola. He didn't say Hydrilla fertisolata, right, either. Meg did. Um, so uh, eagle killer living on Hydrilla, a little bit dramatic, but you know, took us a while to figure it out. So we were able to um, actually morphologically and genetically characterize this new species, and it was a new species, new genus, <laughs> and it was in the wrong family originally. So we've we got that straight now. Um, you can see it with the naked eye. These spots uh, are, you know, an individual cell of a toxinose is five microns, but you get enough of those cells in a colony and you can actually see it with the naked eye. But it's kind of hard to see under a microscope in some ways because it's so cryptic against that background and it doesn't come off of the leaf like other epiphytic uh, algae do. It just is sticking on there like with the polysaccharide boundary that it has, so it's like glued to the hydrilla. So we mount the whole leaf, and it's always on the underside of the leaf that it grows. That's a lower pH environment for an epiphytic um, cyanobacteria to grow on, which is weird because most cyanobacteria like higher nutrient and often higher pH systems, but this cyanobacteria likes low pH and low conductivity systems, and it does really well growing directly on it plant that provides the right substrate. And so, I don't know if you can't see that, but you saw it in the video, I think, where if you turn off the regular light, you can turn on fluorescent light, and then you're, you just see the autofluorescence of cyanobacterial pigments. So you can see that distinct from the chlorophyll A of the leaf. And this um, schematic was done after we'd been doing some work for a while, but yeah, originally, whenever they collected coots across the southeast, they found 10 different reservoirs where they documented lesions in the coots that were overwintering on the reservoirs. So that was the first clue that it was a lot more extensive than we had suspected originally. And yeah, get to see the tubers and turions again. It spreads really well, and it's quite possible that the cyanobacteria can also um, maintain its trichome or overwintering stage within a tuber or turion. <coughs> so John Mears is an excellent herpetologist at, at UGA and made this schematic of some of the different food chain um, effects that we were testing with some of the, using our senior thesis students and some animals that we could gather and, and testing whether or not these species, these taxa are uh, susceptible to the toxin. One of the earliest studies with, with the herbivorous turtles, and it actually took almost three months before we started to see impairment in the turtle. So maybe a larger bodied organism um, and maybe a little bit more resistance to being affected by it, but uh, we saw with histology that it had the same lesions that the birds do. And he has this ataxia in his hind limbs, which we'll see again. And the tadpoles that were in the the aquarium with the hydrilla eating it directly, they died pretty quickly. Within 30 days, um, all of these species that were actually getting hydrilla with the cyanobacteria were dying off. If they just ate hydrilla, they were fine. But if we were collecting it from lakes where we had the, the cyanobacteria growing and also lakes where we didn't have it growing. So that's an important point to make right off is that it doesn't grow on hydrilla everywhere, but it can grow on both dioecious and the Monetius biotite. So I'm very interested in getting more Connecticut River samples. Especially, I know there's a reservoir, right, associated with the Connecticut River in the section where it's infested. That was the best sample they had. And this is a sad um, video, but it shows the effect it had on this little catamorphic uh, mole salamander. And they um, are pretty susceptible to it, and they start 
turning over and not being able to right themselves the same way the birds do. And we see seizures and paralysis in many of the taxa where we've tested them. And so the neuroscientist that I'm working with at UGA, um, Jim Lauderdale, says, you know, we don't know whether or not, which is, which is a downstream effect. Does the toxin cross the blood-brain barrier and cause those lesions? And that causes seizures? Or do we have a way we're triggering a seizure with the toxin and then that causes lesions? So it's, it could be iterative, unfortunately. Um, and these water snakes and the amphibians, we did, we tested to see whether or not it could move through this trophic level. So we got loaded them with prey that had consumed the hydrilla with cyanobacteria directly and then fed that to the predators. And both of them ended up getting lesions, but for the amphibians and snakes, it was more in the olfactory region, which was pretty interesting, and also in the cervical spinal cord. We saw these uh, lesions. And so moving along on that same idea of how does it move th trophically through these systems, uh, we started working in Florida, because as you know, they have a very active uh, invasive plant management program down there, and they have all the invasives. So you can just go study it there. Um, and uh, well one of the managers said, well, what if uh, the snail kites are getting it because these new invasive apple snails eat so much hydrilla and they basically excluded the, the native ones. And they're much more fecund, they're larger, and the snail kites have shifted to eating these bigger invasive snails. So we wanted to test and see whether or not we had it in Florida, but if we did, if it could be passed through an invertebrate and, and be a risk to these endangered birds. They're really cool. We collected hydrilla from a lake where we knew we had the cyanobacteria growing on the hydrilla, and we collected apple snails from South Georgia in an area where we didn't have any, uh, any indication that there was uh, a problem there with the cyanobacteria, and we fed that to chickens. So they did get it, you know, proof of concept. We could say that it, it was moving through that food chain. They won't let us experiment on the Snail kites, no, we don't want to. <laughs> but <laughs> we have, so we are work continuing to work with the folks in um, Florida on this because we now, since we have completely characterized the new toxin, we have analytical methods to test for it. We don't have to feed it to something to see if they have gotten, if they're, if they're affected by it as much. All right. And we have done a l some work with the eagles, with tracking them. Just, it's a quite expensive <laughs> pro problem to attack, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service helped us with some banding, and, and this is Livy Mojica, who's this Conservation Biology Institute, helped us get some of them transmitted. But what we found is that the birds, because they're, they have that natal homing back to the reservoir where they're born, even if they survive from a reservoir that's affected by this, they're likely to come back and they die either the first year or the next year. So we, we were seeing a lot of um, eagle mortality, especially in J. Strom Thurman Reservoir, which is an uh, Army Corps reservoir that's in series on the Savannah River. A lot of our work was has been done in this location. And I've sort of been, get rid of hydrilla <laughs> for a very long time. And they have. Um, and in doing was, I'll, I'll get back to it, but we have managed to get hydrilla out of Lake Thurman for right now, and I'll tell you how we did that. But I have a little bit more information on the background on the toxin first. So I think I told you that we initially we had to use bioassays because we didn't have a way to quantify the toxin, so we had to feed it to a chicken to see if it got sick or if it got lesions. But that's very expensive, and n none of the people that work with me like to kill things. So we, we tried to minimize that if possible. And so we were doing s uh, tissue culture, cell line bioassay, which was pretty good, but it was just telling us when the cyano was present, but there's a certain point in the year, seasonally, when it starts to produce toxins. So that was sort of the secret. We wanted to something that could detect the toxin accurately. And that turned out to be both the seriodaphnia and the larval zebrafish, which are a very good model organism because we share a lot of their genetic information, and there's so many different 
genetic strains of them, you can do a lot of work with zebrafish. And that's what Jim Lauderdale and Tabby have been working on. So that allowed us then to take that messy um, HPLC trace from the crude extract from our hydrilla and cyanobacteria and say which part of this is important. And it turned out to be this great big peak that was way down the line because it's lipid soluble and it uh, has a really high molecular weight. So m many of the toxins, ex especially cyanotoxins, are water soluble, so they'd come off really early on the column, but this is pretty late. And it, it, it occurs seasonally, so we don't see it in the summer, uh, unless you treat hydrilla with diquat dibromide, and then you can get toxins in the summer. But that's another story. All right, and this is showing how the zebrafish look when they've been exposed in a water bath. And this little guy is just flipping his pectoral fins, and this one's stuck upside down. They hardly move at all once they get exposed to the toxin, whereas the solvent controls are zipping around like zebrafish should. And at a fairly consistent and low rate of toxin exposure in that water bath, um, she was seeing mortality. And it's not even very water soluble, so it was kind of a hard <laughs> test for her to do. We're going to do a mouse trial where we'll gavage or inject actually the toxin into mice for uh, an acute and then chronic dose. So we haven't done that yet and we certainly need to. Uh, but yeah, she did a kind of a schematic of how much they <laughs> swim around when they're in the toxin bath versus the clean solvent and it's quite different. And there was uh, one of the zebrafish had a special fluorescent probe for calcium so that whenever they were, were observing a seizure, you could see the calcium flood in and it doesn't come out. So there's something to do with calcium channels that's linked with the seizures. More, more needs to be done on that. But it's really um, kind of scary if you actually see one of the um, mallards having a seizure. They, they get to the point where they're paralyzed in their hind limb or for the, yeah, the ducks, their feet, um, and they, they seem to be blind, like they don't know where you are, and they do a lot of trembling like this. So this was a sentinel mallard, and we did euthanize it immediately, but I just sat it as it is. I want you to see what it looks like. And this is a very sick bird. They don't all like look like this. <coughs> Wildlife usually try to hide if they're sick, or try to fake it because, you know, that's, you'll get eaten if you look like you're sick, which is unfortunately what the eagles were doing, right? They were picking out the sickest coos because they were the easiest prey, or they, they'll feed out of landfills. Like, eagles are kind of lazy, but um, I think that they make an excellent sentinel for this because we could see in the lakes where we had this going on that their nests were failing, so it was a way of knowing from the top predators since we're in trouble. And this is a really cool technique using its mass spec imaging. So you can look at a leaf and see the cyanobacteria and see the cyanotoxin there. Uh, we could do the same thing with tissues now. So we're starting to work on determining what's in the tissues of some of these animals. And people ask me, well, where's the bromide coming from? They alluded to that in the um, video. We certainly have a, a lot of coal-fired power plants in Georgia, and those reservoirs are drinking water reservoirs, so they're also putting in brominated compounds to help with this infection. Then the combination uh, seems to make things a lot more bioavailable, and hydrilla can hyperaccumulate contaminants from sediment, so the level that's in the water is not that concerning. The level that's in the sediment is pretty elevated, but what's in the hydrilla itself is very high, so that was the source for the toxin production in the field whenever the plants die back, then that becomes available to the cyanobacteria to finish making the toxin molecule. So that's when Stefan Ringwilliger and he and Tabby were first authors on this paper, our students, and was able to just add it to his cultures and then he got toxin production. He called that one the big one, the big peak, <laughs> so you can see at the end. And it's a pretty cool molecule. And that's a lot of bromide on it. And even if those peel off, 
it may still be toxic, so they're looking at breakdown products too. And they were able to confirm that this was the same type of, of intramyelinetic edema, <laughs> where it's a splitting of the myelin layer. Um, and you can see it even in these little elegant dendrocytes get kind of exploded. We also found it in fish tissues, and this was collected from J. Strom Thurman too, again, during the time period when we did still have hydrilla throughout Lake Thurman. And we were, one of the student who conducted this was doing it in September, his collection, so that it would be before there was toxin produced in the lake, and then he did collections in November. But they did uh, a treatment in one of the coves uh, with diquat and comine a week before he went out and sampled, and then he ended up getting toxin from that sampling event. But there was the most, the highest concentrations are still in the hydrilla or in the GI tract, so if something is consuming the whole fish, they probably get the whole thing. But for us, if we're going to fillet it, there's still significant toxin in, in the game fish fillets. <coughs> the first time we sent the paper into science, they said, okay, but you have to take it all the way back around and show us that you have it in coots that you collected from the field. So we did do some more analysis and found that they actually have pretty high levels in the breast tissue and thigh tissue. And uh, that's uh, fairly significant. And these were two coots that I found dead at Lake Thurman. So they were obviously had, had a pretty high dose. But we are concerned that, again, the waterfowl are consuming this. People are consuming these tissues. And it is hard to get rid of hydrilla once you get it in there. <laughs> there are um, chemical controls that I, I've mentioned a drawback with that. I, I want to keep all the tools that we have <laughs> in the toolbox. I'm not against using chemicals at all. I think there's certainly a time and place, and maybe you get a little faster. If you can get rid of it early, like smaller infestation, I mean, it's a story for every invasive. But especially if you're not treating it, a time period when it's sort of maxed out in terms of biomass in the fall would be the most dangerous time to try to kill it with chemicals. And if you're trying to use something like, I, I didn't even mention it, but sometimes people will, will say, well, can't we just pull it all out? Mm, probably not. <laughs> but also, if you go and cut it or just try to mow it down, you're just spreading it around because, again, those turions that are in the leaf axles can just pop up uh, anywhere else now and grow in a new place. So very difficult to use uh, anything other than what has been effective are these grass carb. But we wanted to test and see if you use grass carb, they're sterile, they're triploid, they live about 12 years, um, and they like the hydrilla a lot. They will eat it until it is gone and they'll start eating other stuff. But um, they're kind of controversial. Uh, they've been overused in many Texas lakes where they first were using them to control. They just eliminated everything. They were like eating the grass off of the edge. But we recommend sort of an iterative um, program where you don't stock that many the first year, and then you just follow up with uh, five stocking. So we probably, a lot of people who did this originally were like 40 fish per infested acre. And we're like, no, how about 10? And then if you need more, you can add more the next year. And that does seem to work. We did find that when we tested using grass carp on material we knew to be toxic, that they did get the lesions, but they didn't die, and they still ate all the hydrilla. When we used smaller fish, they definitely died from it. So it would, ha it would be good to start with as large a fish as possible, so there's fewer things that can eat it, but also because they have a larger body mass and maybe can survive it and still eat the hydrilla and get rid of it, I would think. And so we've done combinations where in we have used some herbicide early in the year to try to clear out um, a, a newer infestation and then couple that with some uh, stocking of grass carp. Because when the fish are exposed to it, this was our smaller grass carp that we fed uh, toxic hydrilla too, they, they have extensive lesions just, just like the birds. In the optic region, similar to the birds. <coughs> this is from one of Tabby's schematic of all the different um, parts of the trophic web that we know are affected right now. And I think the critical thing here is that it's a uh, novel, neurotoxic, <laughs> lipid-soluble 
compound that's very stable. It doesn't break down with heat or cold. So we think it's probably still around even with hydrolithon. Where does it go? Well, we're, we're working on that. But um, it does seem like this is there's potential for bioaccumulation in the system. And since uh, they have been able to synthesize it, we now can do this mouse trial that I'm alluding to because we can actually use a pure compound. And they have found all of the gene clusters responsible for making that toxin. So one of my students and my husband, Dr. Dayton Wild, is a geneticist in the front row, is helping with this to come up with a um, PCR field method, which is LAMP. It's, it's, I call it Barbie PCR. But <laughs> it's like a little, little tiny PCR which has a uh, isothermal reaction, so just like a light bulb in there, and you can do DNA detections in the field that way. And there's a lot more things that we think are affected by it, uh, and we want to continue to investigate in the field and, and get our eyes on any problems they have there uh, and help out in any situations in which we feel like we might be seeing the same disease, but somebody called it something different. And that's happened a couple times now. But we knew we had this beaver that was living in Stace Ram Thurman Reservoir, and one of the homeowners reported it. He said that he was the first one to call me. Like, if the coots are coming, he will call me, <laughs> tell me they're coming in. That's helped a lot to work with the, the folks that live on the lakes and lake managers, which I think you all do. Um, that's really good information. But he said, I got the sick beaver. Well, I'll bring it over to Squidus, which is our veterinary pathology unit at UGA that's done a lot of work on this. And they found that it was not only neurologically impaired in the similar manner, but it, it did have the same lesions. So we kind of know mammals are susceptible. Beavers eat a lot of aquatic vegetation, especially during this time of year if it's abundant. So finding the hydrilla and autochthonous in their guts wasn't too surprising. <coughs> Um, and they had these lesions in um, the cerebrum and, and in the cerebellar tracts. Um, oops, I got ahead of myself. So um, from, from this information, we, we're pretty sure that mammals are also affected by this, but we don't know yet at what level, like compared to some other toxins. And this is more recent um, information, and I still don't know if this is this the same toxin is causing this neuropathy in the Florida panthers and bobcats, but um, we got our lab that we work with in Athens, EPA. Um, Matt Henderson and Seth McWhorter, a student of mine, are working on this, and we've extracted the tissues from these sick panthers and found the toxin in the tissues. We don't know what level is critical, so at this point, it presents clinically like uh, vacular myelinopathy that we've seen in the other taxa, and it's got that toxin in its tissue. So there's a lot of things that those poor <laughs> uh, panthers and bobcats have to deal with down in Florida. So we're going to be looking at more tissues and looking at the prey base to see, you know, where would that have come from. Do you see the bobcat also? Okay, we'll go on to a happier bobcat. Oh, here's some kittens. The panther kittens did survive, but they were that was their mother, and um, you can see in this video. I hope. And we, one of the first samples we got we got was from FP two fifty six, which was one of their most. They had a lot of video of this panther, um, and these are kittens. And the little guy in the back is just kind of sleeping, but this one in the front seems pretty happy. And so perhaps they can survive it if they're taken away from whatever that you know, toxic food source was. Yeah, so we don't know, though. I mean, all right, and another thing that I'm going to throw out here just because we're talking about uh, forestry today a lot is that I found out um, sort of accidentally that uh, one of my students brought pine beetles back from a lake that did not have hydrilla and said, you're going to like this, Dr. Wild. It, it has gooey green stuff on it. And it had a toxinus, what looked like a toxinus, growing on pine needles. They're in the water, so it's not like it was in the tree, but it's a substrate that has can concentrate bromide and is a low pH substrate, especially on some parts of the needle. So 
I was collecting a few needles off of some lake to see if I could. Um, that's another concern. Is there a no way that if you got rid of hydrilla, if it can still grow on other things, then maybe you still have a source of it there if something comes along that's a good substrate to grow on. Another thing that's been really helpful is looking at eBird data sites because if you see a concentration of waterfowl in, in southeastern reservoirs, there's probably a lot of plants there. And if it's a southeastern reservoir, it's probably not native. So to me, that's been a clue that um, lakes that have a lot of ringneck ducks and a lot of people out there watching them and recording them, it helps us track you know, what their densities are and then we'll see a cold snap. And this is one we've been tracking, this Covington Pond, and then we go from having a lake full of waterfowl to just having like predator scat and a lot of feather piles. So I think that they can, they can take advantage of the coyotes were coming in and eating the waterfowl as they were dying. <coughs> and uh, d I do love what, we're working with Ian Fixon and USGS to continue to explore any new locations that come into us. So that really helps us know if there's a, a new infestation and, and citizens can really help with that, taking those pictures, sending them, letting us know right away where that is. And my student, um, Wes Guerin, has worked on modeling this for a while. And it really appears that the lakes with that that low conductivity granite substrate and pine forested regions are more likely to be our AVM sites. Like, and because pines like lower pH soils, and if you do pine silviculture over a long term, you actually reduce that soil pH even a little more. So I think there's a connection there. I'm not saying <laughs> it's all the pine's fault. But I think there's a connection there that will be interesting to keep looking at. Like, what is it about this watershed that makes it vulnerable? And I would love for any of you uh, who are interested to send me plants, but it probably is better to coordinate it through Meg and others who are working up here, too, so we know, like, what, what would be coming in. But I'm, I'm able to see a lot more <laughs> if people can just send me plants directly, and I do have an APHIS permit for shipping um, from these states, so that would be great to have your help. And yeah, I have a zillion acknowledgments. I'll leave up there so you all can ask questions, because I like that part better. And it's it's on growing on it, then you know you would probably be invading with the same cyanobacteria. It looks like it grows on water willow too, and that may be a different species. So that's another indication to me that maybe it was already there, but that sub that hydrilla just presents so much substrate that it's ideal for its growth um, that it did better in those locations. Just that, um, I think, I want to say it was the Hudson River also had the same, where they, the highest levels of bromide were downstream from coal fire power plants, followed by disinfection byproducts, including brominated compounds. So if, if you have a reservoir where you have uh, low oxygen down in, in the deep area, that's when bromide becomes available in a system. So if you add, say, uh, the reason diquat has never been a concern, bromide just, just gloms onto sediment almost immediately or plant surfaces. So it's not in the water, 
so people were not so worried about it. But I think now that we know PFOS and other plastic particles also really sticky to these kind of contaminants, we may want to think about the possibility that it could be it. It's in drinking water reservoirs, it could be a concern. Even though it's not water soluble, it could be drawn in and sticking on to it. Did I answer your question? They're adding it to water that then gets recirculated through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, probably bromine is more toxic, and, and but but chlorine certainly. Uh, I mean, there's chlorinated compounds that are. It, 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 yeah, yeah, but yeah, PCBs. Yeah, and I think what was the uh, chloride? Was it? There was another one. Iodide. They were concerned about switching it in. Yeah. Okay. No, I am working with um, Georgia EPD and CDC in Atlanta because they have to put out the fish consumption advisories. So now, when Georgia DNR goes out to collect fish for PCBs and mercury, they they collect some. And we only need like a little tiny like bioassay plug to, to be able to extract it and then determine what the toxin is. So we're trying to work toward that, but because we haven't done this mouse trial yet, uh, we need funding for that if somebody has money for it. Um, we, we, we will be able to say definitively that this would be a danger to people if we knew at least that we had a positive mouse trial and we know what the levels are in the fish that they're eating and how frequently they eat it. So that kind of full-scale risk assessment hasn't been done, but we're getting data for it, and we're kind of trying to push the federal agencies to be more involved and help with that, because I think it's real. <laughs> yeah, and I think the last time when I was up here, I was like, but, but we're such different systems. But the more I am up here and listen to you, low pH systems, blah, 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 I don't, I, I just think it's, it's weirdly not what you usually worry about with the cyanobacteria blooms. I think it's interesting that Lake George is now getting the planktonic harmful algal blooms with that a added nitrogen that's getting released from those hemlocks. That's right. Or at least maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Uh, and you had a question? Oh, that, so that's why it, this this Florida thing was surprising, because we found that cyanobacteria growing from in the Kissimmee chain of lakes from like Orlando down, but not in Lake Okeechobee. It has very high conti conductivity there, but in this pa panther wildlife recreation area, we sort of have a pocket of pines and and some a little bit higher ground in the same way that that mid Florida ridge supports it. So I think it's possible that it could grow down there. But also, this started happening 2017 after the giant Hurricane Irma came and <laughs> all the way across Florida. Now we just had Ian <laughs> right through that same area. And you think it travels through canals. In Florida, like, everything's wet after a hurricane. Like, everything's connected. You can go across the whole state in that airboat. Yeah, I worry about then that also rips all the hydrilla out of some lakes and just throws it every other places. So I think that would be a really good way of spreading it around too. So the cyanobacteria plus the hydrilla and then the cyanobacteria makes the toxin. And we don't know if the toxin remains there longer or if it's moving around somehow in, in some of these systems with canals and frequent hurricanes. And then some of the lakes, it scrubs it so clean that it's so mucky that it doesn't grow back for a little while because it needs a little bit of light to get started there. It grows back.
<laughs> she's going to be good for me, too. More and more questions. you're doing it I mean you're working together with nonprofits citizens local folks and people that are on the ground managing it all the way up to people that are trying to push for the right regulation for the future I think it takes all of those things but just making sure you can be in the same room when you're planning management so that everybody is on the same page they do a lot of that in Georgia the structured decision making like where you just bring all the stakeholders and you have very different ideas but if we're in the same room talking to each other, we'll come up with a solution that keeps everyone equally unhappy. Isn't that what the Army Corps' vision is? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I mean, they have, they have challenges, but yeah, they always told me that, too. We just want to make sure everyone's equally unhappy. So the microcystin is the, the most common cyanobacterial toxin, glad you mentioned, and it's produced by a number of species, but almost all the time when microcystis originosa is in bloom, that one produces that water-soluble toxin, and that's a planktonic bloom. So you look out in the water and you see like all the scum, that, that is the sort of planktonic bloom that we're used to studying, and now we're realizing that these epiphytic uh, cyanobacteria produce sort of a hidden risk and there's also cyanobacteria that grow in streams e in California and Georgia we found them that are also producing neurotoxins and they're benthic so they just kind of grow on the mud or on the bottom and then dogs will go out and stir it up or maybe lick their fur and that can be neurotoxic at fairly low levels and that's an anatoxin another neurotoxin but it's water soluble goes away pretty quick I just think this is the worst of both and that it's Lipid soluble and persistent. So it's, yeah. And other species may make this toxin too. So that's why we're looking to see if there's other species that might have the same gene clusters. It's not in any gin bank, or, you know, we don't know of one yet, but we're going to keep looking for that. Yeah. They didn't even notice the coots in 94. They're like, Coots were dying, probably, but we were just looking at eagles at that point. Yeah. That's the weird thing about um, Monaceous hydrilla in China, and other people may know more about this, it's not really aggressive. Like, it just doesn't get out of control. So... I don't, I don't know. It's quite possible that there's vascular myelinopathy and people don't detect it because if this toxin were at a lower level, it might just have sublethal effects or something you wouldn't recognize. But yeah, I think that we know that there's monoecious and dioecious clades from China and then as we saw earlier. And yeah, there's ways they move through. What Dayton always thinks is most interesting is where's the last place this came from? Like, not necessarily the origin, but, like, where was it most recently um, before it came to the U.S.? And that's hard to track, but I think genetic can, can tracking can help with that a lot. And we're supposed to be working with Nathan Harms and Dean Williams on that, so we need to keep whatever co collections they can do and we can share and we can get information on that, too. Yeah, eagles are doing great. It's a, it's more of a specific areas where we can say that in this area of Piedmont, Georgia, where we know this is happening, that eagles are not doing well. And last year, the areas that got hit the hardest by the avian influenza were also coincident with my watershed. So I think if you have both, if you already have a toxin or some contaminants in you, and then you get a disease, you're much more vulnerable. And even turkey vultures and black vultures were dying from avian influenza last year and 
they generally are very tolerant to toxins. So I think it's possibly coupled that there's we have more contaminants in our environment and we're spreading more diseases around, so they're getting a double whammy probably. All right. Well, we'll, we'll maybe we'll talk more after the next. Okay. Keep on yeah, going. <laughs>
There you go. Sorry. Usually I'm loud enough that I don't even need the microphone. Um, so, so, so Bill's here representing the Adirondack Watershed Institute. We are so incredibly lucky to have um, AWI as our partners in the Adirondack Prism leading our stewardship program to having, um, you know, hundreds of boat stewards at dozens and dozens of launches across the Adirondacks. They have one of the largest watercraft inspection programs um, in the United States, I think the largest one east of the Mississippi. And, you know, I always tell everybody, one of the most important things that we do here in the Adirondacks is the prevention. You know, if you look at our research that we've been doing, our map up over there, you know, over 75% of our lakes in the Adirondacks that we've monitored are free of aquatic invasive species. And a big reason for that is the years of dedication of, um, you know, AWI leading that and working with us and our other partners. So we're super thankful to have him here. And Bill will talk about, you know, so it's not just him, it's all his, his great team right there. So he's going to talk about um, what they're doing for the prevention side. Brian, how do I, how do I click it? Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, as Brian said, my name is Bill Brasso. I'm just fortunate to be the stewardship director for the Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute, with a lot of words. Um, a lot of times we'll call it AWI for short, just so, they're, so everyone's clear on their acronyms. Um, and just thanks, Brian, thanks, Tamara, thanks, TNC, APEP, all of you for being here, people online somewhere, wherever that is. Um, yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you a little bit about AWI and our work. Um, we've heard it all morning. We heard it just recently, and I'll say it again. This is not a singular action, right? This is no one organization, one person, one anything. It's a group effort for sure. Um, I just want to say that again. It's um, our partners, federal, state, nonprofits, individual people, youngsters talking to their parents, all of it is really, really important. I just want to, I can't say that enough, and I think you all know it, but I think it's worth saying multiple times. Um, I also just want to say, just as a, on a personal note, like I've learned so much, and it just reminds me of how much I love, and I'm sure I'm not unique to this, to how much I think I know and how much I don't know, and how important these uh, sessions are, just for me on a personal level, and I'm sure I speak for many of you who just like, wow, I just like, I have so much to learn. Um, so, anyway, it's really great. Um, so, um, AWI, a um, little bit just go over a few things. I would just talk, for many of you are probably aware of um, the Adirondack Watershed Institute. I would just touch on that a little bit. Um, as well as talking about um, our Aquatic Invasive Species Spread Prevention Program, sometimes known as AIS, just to say that, uh, acronyms. Um, just touch on that. Um, Brian gave us a little bit of a snapshot into that. Um, Talk about this idea of last water body, a um, little bit about hydrella intersections, which is the primary part of the topic, and then just kind of summarize my thoughts, or my thoughts, our thoughts on that. Um, so I think I'll go from there. Um, ADRI's mission, you can read it. I'll pull out the, the, the big things, protect clean water, conserve habitat, um, supporting the health and being of people in the Adirondacks. That's kind of our, that's our mission as an organization. Um, how we do that is like three pillars. Um, or three like legs of the stool, as they say, um, this idea behind science, community, and stewardship. Um, and just touch on that, you know, our for science, um, you know, our goal is to understand these major environmental threats around climate change, invasive species, impacts such as road salt, and take, and we want that science and to share it with, with we're not, you know, it's not about putting it on the shelf, it's actually putting it into action. Giving it, um, sharing with folks, giving it to people to use in whatever way that means, whether it's, whether it's teachers, whether it's through youngsters, whether it's our elected officials to help make good decisions based on science. And I think for me, that's the takeaway. I've only been with the organization for six months, but one of the big things I really enjoy about it is it's at its, that its foundation is science and that it's action. You know, it's that part that really resonates with me personally, um, and I just want to say that. Um, the other, another pillar, our second pillar would be community. The idea is being engaged, that AWI is engaged with our partners. Again, wide range of partners, but that we're working with folks to uplift them in whatever way, to have to make sure the voices are being heard around these environmental threats that are out there. Um, 
what they are and, and what actions can be taken um, you know, and what we can do to have a, a positive impact with those. Um, and, then, and then lastly, stewardship. Um, and stewardship is really around engagement, um, around engagement and inspiring like, stewards, right? Environmental stewards. Um, and, and they could be youngsters, they could be young adults, they can be residents, um, year-round residents, part-time, summertime residents, people who visit here, so that they care not about the not only about the outer lands and waters within the park, um, but even back home, wherever home might be, that we're you know really kind of just like planting that I always say that proverbial seed in whatever way that means, and and somehow it blossoms, and sometimes it blossoms right away. I'm sure we've all seen it, like eyes open, um, and sometimes it takes a while, but that's okay. You know that's we're, it's, I always say it's just one step at a time. I did a lot of ecological restoration work in my career, and a lot of it's just one square foot at a time. And it just builds on one another and makes a difference from that perspective. Um, and then there's um, stewardship in regards to um, our spread prevention program. Okay. Um, since the year, since 2000, AWI has partnered with public and private entities across the park to manage um, a pretty comprehensive, as Brian said, aquatic invasive species spread prevention program. It's a big word. Um, this map of the, of the park um, represents over 60 different sites that are both places where our stewards are at launches. Um, that include both um, there as stewards, just talking with folks, um, but also having decontamination stations. We also have roadside decontamination stations as well. Um, and these also, this map also represents some other stations that are owned by many of our partners, including the Lake Champlain Basin Program here. Um, and then I would say, our collective goal um, is to inform the public about aquatic invasive species. So it's like the what. Um, why it's important to prevent the spread. So it's like the so what, as I often say. And then how can we, and it's always a we, um, prevent the spread. And it's kind of like the now what piece of it. Um, and that's, that's really it. I mean, it's that education piece is really critical. And just to share some numbers, um, we always have numbers. Um, Last number of years on an annual basis, um, AWI stewardship program, as well as with our partners, reach about 190,000 boaters per year. Um, that we inspect about 95,000 watercraft um, and decontaminate about nearly 3,700 boats from that perspective. So it's a big number. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. This idea around last water body, um, Meg actually reminded me of this of just a week or two ago in our email correspondence. Um, but it's just, it's like a critical question. You know, it's an important question that we ask every single voter. And I'll put it in quotes because this is what we ask is what, you know, was the, where was the last, was the watercraft in the water in the last two weeks? And if so, where? So that's the really critical question. Um, most boats um, are launched in the same water body, upwards of 75 to 80 percent always go in that same water body. It's my home water, right? It's like I pull it out of the shed or wherever um, in the spring, put it, in, and that's the same one I go to every time. And the message is really important to them around aquatic invasive species, but it's even more important for the other 25, 20 to 25%, right? Because those are folks that are moving between water bodies and such. Um, so that's good news. Um, and that allows us and our partners to really focus on those fewer boats that pose a, the greater threat to moving aquatic invasive species from water body to water body. Um, and I just want to give one example of one I had on a personal level. Um, last month I was staffing a launch um, and folks came up and I said, you know, good morning. And they have, and, and that was the, I asked them the question and they said Cayuga Lake. Well, you mentioned, you, we heard earlier that Cayuga Lake actually has hydrilla. Um, so it raised my awareness, you know, in, in a sense, because I, all our stewards know where, you know, have, we have a list of all the different water bodies across the state and adjoining states and what um, invasives are in those water bodies. So it raised our awareness. Um, and I had a really solid conversation with these folks. You know, we talked about what it is, why, what they can do about it, and offered de decontamination. And they were like, just super excited and, and really thankful for that awareness and also that they can get something is a solution for them. In this case, it was decontamination and such. So I think it was just a really, for me and a personal, you know, learning about this m deeper um, and such, it was really gratifying from that perspective. Um, so hydrilla. Um, 
So to date, AWI stewards have inspected, have intercepted hydrilla on four different occasions, um, three in 2021 from the Potomac, um, Potomac and the Delaware rivers, and then one in two seven, 2017 from the Potomac River also. Um, and from my perspective, that's good news, right? It tells me that our collective focus on aquatic invasive species education is, is working, that there's folks that are aware of it, we're inspecting, we're de decontamination is working, and it needs to continue, right? It's just an ongoing thing. It's something, if there's anything we learn around this type of work, is that you can't just like sit back on your laurels and it's something you, not to get depressed about it, but to be just consistent with it. Um, and I think to kind of summarize with lots of good photos and smiling faces and such of our stewards um, and such, I just summarizing this is that what we know is that invasive, um, invasive species awareness amongst the boating public is on the increase for sure. It's a question we ask. And I would say my own experience is limited for this year, um, but I have colleagues who have been doing, doing this for a lot of years, is that folks are more aware of it than they were, they were X number of years ago. And that's a good thing um, from that point of view. We also know that the percentage of boats carrying invasive species and organisms has decreased. Right? So that's good. We ask that question and we, have, and we inspect boats uh, on a volunteer basis. You know, we offer that opportunity, that service to boaters to inspect the boats. Um, and we know that having a, con and I think we know this, right, is having a consistent presence over time, you know, and we've been doing this for since the year 2000 and in real concerted effort for the last five years um, of sharing that message, that consistent message of not only here in the park, New York State, the region, but really across the country, this idea around clean, drain, dry, and those best practices. I think from a marketing perspective, it's like great. It's like it's simple, it's sweet, it's like it's consistent. Voters hear it. And then, you know, and they begin to understand it. And, and that's the point, is trying to change people's habits and awareness around this. Um, we also know that providing inspections and decontamina decontamination services, again, on a consistent basis, so I'm always arriving at launch, and there's Mary, you know, there from that point of view, um, that the decontamination place locations are easy to get to, relatively speaking, and when they arrive, it's like 10, 15 minutes in many cases, and they're on their way. Um, it's just really important. Um, change that behavior and to ultimately spread, you know, prevent the spread of invasive species, including hydrilla. And that's it. So thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's, we, you know, there's, only, there's a lot of places to enter the water and we can only cover so many, right? And, and, and so I try, try, I think, I answered your question in a moment, but you know, I think ultimately what we're trying to do is just be out there enough consistently over time and over years and people talk to other people and, and it becomes a spread, spread the word in a sense so that, you know, so if a person isn't there, hopefully I've already inspected my boat. I take a moment to look at it, especially like if I'm going into the water body and I'm retrieving. I'm taking a moment to clean my prop and such. Um, but it's a good question. We can't be, what we try to do is be, you know, besides the fact that, you know, admittedly hiring has been hi challenging the last few years, but that aside, hopefully that'll get better. Um, I think what we'll do is focus our efforts on those places where we have the greatest impact, you know, as much as we can. Those places where we know there's a lot of boats, perhaps there's a lot of, not only boats, but maybe a lot of boats from other places from that point of view and to really try, because you never have enough resource, right, it, to do any of, any of this type of work. So we really try to focus. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, certainly if anyone else has any thoughts on it, and I don't know if you had raised your hand. Oh, there's a hand.
then, um, yes, yeah, so, um, you know, we just went over the prevention aspect, but unfortunately there are cases in New York where hydrilla has established in these water bodies. And so after, you know, prevention comes what we like to talk about early detection and then management. So we're really lucky to have um, Kate Monticelli uh, from the Finger Lakes Prism. We're so lucky here in New York that we have these partners in regional invasive species management, and I really enjoy when I get to talk with my counterparts from other prisms because there's so much learning that, that we can do. Um, Kate is the Hydrilla Program Manager and has been with the Finger Lakes Institute since 2016, um, working on several of these areas that are infested with um, hydrilla. So she's going to tell us on the ground how can you manage this, what are some of the things to, to do. So I'm going to bring up your PowerPoint over here. I tend to be soft-spoken, but you can hear me through the microphone okay? Is that acoustic? Better? Okay, cool. I think this is the first in-person presentation I've had the opportunity to give since 2019. <laughs> so, yay! <laughs> um, yes, our region. Uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, here are the, the eight prism regions in New York. So we are the neighbors to the west. We cover 17 counties uh, in central New York, and our program's always been very aquatics focused because the Finger Lakes are there, and Lake Ontario, and lots of other places. <laughs> and there are a, f you know, a few populations of hydrilla that have been established in our region. Um, <coughs> you know, I'm, there are you know, some isolated, privately owned ponds. I know Meg mentioned um, the one that's connected to the Susquehanna River, I think, earlier. Um, but the ones that I'm going to focus on mostly are the ones on Cayuga Lake. Uh, they're zoomed in on the right over here. Um, by no means is it the whole lake, so I don't like calling it one population. There's, there are huge lakes, and Hydrilla is not covering the whole thing. They're very, very you know, discrete populations. But there is, you know, more likely spread across that lake because there are populations there. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of context for where we're talking about. So I'm going to talk about a couple, you know, case studies where we have employed different management techniques. Um, and so I'll be talking about a smaller pond that's in the, the northwest part of our region called uh, Tinker Nature Park Pond. And then a couple of the populations on Cayuga Lake. And then I think a lot of what I'm going to say is going to echo some earlier talks. Hydrilla very much follows the invasion curve. It, its populations just explode if uncontrolled. The best time to deal with it is to prevent it, one, but as we know, the next best thing is early detection. And again, I'm not going to copy everything that Meg said earlier because she did a great job, but I just think that having the, the extra pictures, the maybe slightly different wording, if it helps you remember, great. And you know, related to our early detection part is you need to go look for it in order to know that it's there. It's not always, you're not always going to see just the one big stand of hydrilla that's a jungle. Um, or if it is already a jungle, that, that's not great. That's not exactly early detection. Um, so as far as focusing where you're looking, um, I would say the, the Great Lakes Hydrilla Risk uh, Assessment, that's the word. <laughs> um, there's a lot of really good information in there for what type of habitats it likes. Um, but my takeaways from it are waters shallower than 25 feet or 9 meters. Um, where the water temperatures are at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit for two months. It does sprout at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but it's really hard to find if it's just sprouting because it's, it's at the lake bottom, it's in the sediment. Um, it's hard to find when it's down there. It's a lot easier to find later in the season when there's a lot of growth. Um, 
and uh, it's very brittle. It spreads very easily by fragmentation. So if it's already in the water, follow where the water flows. Look for you know protected areas where water would get pushed, and then it could get sheltered. Um, that's the, those are things that I've learned from Cayuga Lake. Just you know, extra extra pictures. What it looks like. Um, I know the the whorls of leaves can be variable, but I've only ever come across it in whorls of five. So look for the five leaves. Look for teeth on the edge of those leaves. There are serrations. Um, I took this from a slide when I do you know plant trainings to quiz people or you know at least guide your your way of thinking of when you're identifying plants. I know aquatic plants are scary. Plants in general are scary to ID. So for aquatic plants, you're looking at them with the same thought process as a tree or something like that. You're looking at the leaf arrangement, how many leaves. Look at the edges of the leaves and the shape of the leaves. Um, if it's a fragment or something, that you, you're most likely not going to come across tubers or turions, especially if it's clade C. Hooray. <laughs> Just makes it harder. <laughs> So again, extra extra pictures. I, I like the visuals myself. Elodia, I lump them together. I was told uh, that they hybridize, so I don't even bother anymore. It's smooth, rolls of three, you're okay. Um, there are lots of you know methods to try to survey for it. The industry standard is the rake toss survey, so Throwing um, a sampling rake that you can make out of a garden rake with the handles cut off. Throw it out in the water with a rope attached. Drag it up, see what's caught on it. That's kind of the, the typical way you're going to survey for aquatic plants. Um, and then visual survey is also helpful. You can't cover as much ground. It takes longer. It's a little more effort, especially for something like scuba, needing the certifications, getting the air tank, things like that. Um, but there are lots of ways to try to look for it. Um, and where would you look for it? Well, we've seen that the aquatic invasive species uh, typically spread along. Um, you know, watercraft, they follow that water, the recreational boating pathway of invasion. So if it's never been introduced in your region before, I would recommend you want to look at boat launches and marinas, even the private ones, not just the public ones. Um, so I took this figure from the risk assessment. Again, it has lots of great information in it. <laughs> I guess only in, well, in our region especially, if you're, if you're looking for spread of a population, follow the water flow, <laughs> but it has to be there first. And I think this morning was great about scary plant. <laughs> it's, it's bad. Uh, it's still a plant, and you would still manage it like any other plant, aquatic plant. Um, and you know your typical management strategies are don't control it. Physical or mechanical, that would be like hand pulling or aquatic vegetation harvester. Uh, chemical control using herbicides, biological control. Um, and your method or a combination of methods is going to really depend on how much is it going to cost, how big is the area you need to manage, is there access, what sort of permitting is involved. All of, all of those things have trade-offs. Um, and so as far as having like a plan in place, you, you need to cater it to each specific site. Um, but having an idea of what to, what to look for, or the process to follow, would still be good. Um, doing nothing. In the southeast, like in Florida, they, they spend millions of dollars just to mow it so that you have a boat channel to go through. Um, you can't do that. It's, no, not an option. <laughs> um, again, I, I, I just like the risk assessment. It's got great stuff in it. Uh, so it's estimated that if hydrilla were to become established in the Great Lakes, um, the, the academic loss would be between 70 and $500 million annually every year. Um, and that doesn't take everything into account, but it, you know, it's the impact on recreational fishing, beach use, recreational boating, 
um, navigation uh, that that doesn't take into effect like the oh, like the, the the drainages the canals that type of thing um, so here are just some examples of physical and mechanical control there's benthic mats um, yeah I'm pretty sure there's depending on where you are permits uh, associated with those uh, I, I'm not I've <laughs> had a a mix of information for that, and I think it has to do with the size and the placement, you know, freshwater wetlands, things like that. Everyone knows about that. And now that, yes, exactly. <laughs> and I don't know those rules because I don't work there. <laughs> um, benthic maps.